Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 172. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. I'm so glad you're here, and today we have a super exciting guest with Tons of really interesting stories from rags to riches, back to rags again. This guest has done it all and experienced so much that he unpacks for us in this episode. So I'm really excited to share that with you. But first, I have a favor to ask from you. If you haven't yet, please go over and leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. It would mean so much to the show. So once you do that, give me a shout out. I'd like to give you a shout out back and send you something in return. So Thanks so much for doing that. Now, let's jump into this week's episode. This week's guest is Greg McCluskey. Greg McCluskey is a professional real estate investor with over 21 years of experience. He started his real estate training after graduating college, where he worked for Franklin Covey for three years. Then, with limited experience, Greg went out and purchased three properties in a span of 30 days, returning profits of $88,000, seventy six thousand dollars and seventy four thousand dollars and from there he was off to the races in 2004 greg was able to flip a total of 104 homes in the salt lake area his success allowed him to expand his real estate business into arizona idaho nevada and massachusetts and then like so many other people in 2008 greg was hit hard by the real estate meltdown He lost everything except for the people he cared for most, his children. Greg has gone on to rebound and do more exciting things, controlling real estate in Ohio, doing commercial properties, more fix and flips, more buy and hold rentals. And he shares all of these trials and tribulations for us in this episode. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Greg, thanks so much for joining us. I'm happy to be here, Jacob. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. It's our pleasure. Looking forward to talking with you. Now, Greg, for the audience members that don't know you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, kind of your history? What drew you to real estate investing exactly? And just kind of share with us your journey. Yeah. So, I mean, a pretty crazy background. I mean, I grew up in a 900 square foot home just south of Boston, Massachusetts. My dad was a security guard for the South Boston Post Office. Eight kids, five girls, one bathroom, three bedrooms. My brother and I were moved into the basement that we had to dig four feet of dirt out of (laughs) in order to then cement the floor. And then my dad gave us sheets to make bedroom walls. And so I tell people that that's where I came from because there's no silver spoon. I paid for my own college. I graduated high school with a 2.0. There was only about three colleges in the country that would even have me. So I had to go to junior college first. I started learning about business and learning about life and reading books that changed my mindset. And after a lot of books and a lot of reading, I I saw an infomercial on TV by Carlton Sheets back in the day, famous Carlton Sheets. And I thought, man, I should buy that and do real estate. And then I didn't because I was a chicken. (laughs) And the next day I went to my dad's house for Thanksgiving and he goes, hey, Greg, I bought this Carlton Sheets course. We should go over it together. Interesting. So my dad and I sat down and we went through the course. And the funny thing is I did something with it. My dad didn't. I bought my first property like two months later with no money down. And it would only be crazy if that, you know, a little crazy if that's where it stopped. But I was a ski instructor at Deer Valley at this time. I'd moved to Utah. I graduated from the University of Utah. That was my senior year at the University of Utah. And I was coming back from skiing at Deer Valley for the day. I had my wife with me, my daughter, and this guy pulled up in a Mercedes and got out and we stopped at the shake 
Mike's shop and he was wearing about a thousand dollar custom suit. I had the goggle eyes from skiing. I had ratty ski pants on, a t-shirt on. I remember it said three on three live basketball tournament. <laughs> Some freebie t-shirt. <laughs> My car was covered in mud. I go in and he's in there and he started talking to me. And I started talking to him and I'm like, man, I don't know what this guy does or who he is, but he makes a lot of money and I need a job. I just graduated college. Ski season's pretty much over. I had one resume in my car. My daughter got chocolate on it and crinkled it. It was in the back seat with her. And the guy walked out and I walked over. I said, I don't know what you do for a living, but here's my resume. And I'm sure you know how to make money, obviously. And I want to learn how to make money. So if you have something for me, give me a call. And I got my car and left. No idea what this guy does. No idea what he does and he was the vice president of sales for carlton sheets wow, <laughs> and, so yeah weird. He hired me because I had the guts to give it to him. And I went to work for Carlton Sheets. And Carlton Sheets at that time was partnered with a company called Franklin Covey. Covey they Leadership, planners, Seven right? Habits. Yeah, Franklin Daily Planners. Yeah. And there I was. I was selling real estate coaching on the phone. Crazy. I did that for two years. And then I did my first three deals for real because I'd done one deal early on, moved into it, did it, no money down like Carlton Sheets said. But then I did three deals in a month. And my partner and I made 84000 78000 the rest was history. I mean, it was a roller coaster, but the rest was real estate was my life now. I quit the job. I got the bank Carlton sheet six months later because Carlton used to come into the office and say, I don't know why you're still here. Like you have <laughs> all the knowledge in the world. And I expect my entire staff to quit on me on a regular basis because they're doing real estate. And I don't understand why you're still here. And me and my partner, Sione, we were the two that up and left. And so it was good. It was awesome. And Carlton loved it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Man, really weird. I, I don't know what you credit that up to or chalk it up to, but you know, you're talking about here you are as a college senior thinking about buying this Carlton Sheets program. The next day you show up at your dad's house for Thanksgiving and he's got it. So coincidence number one, coincidence number two, you're in a gas station outside the ski slopes, hand some random guy your resume, turns out to be the senior vice president of this company. So really weird things that I don't know, just the way the world works, I guess. But uh, interesting. Nature versus about. nurture. Yeah, <laughs> nature versus nurture. <laughs> well, I want to open up with this question I'm pretty anxious to ask you about. And I understand that you say you've learned everything as a real estate investor, coach, leader, entrepreneur, not from some MBA, not from Carlton Sheets, not from some college degree, not from your dad, but from coaching 10 year old girls soccer. So what do you mean by that? Walk us through, you know, your mindset behind that. So I have two daughters that have played collegiately division one soccer. I have another daughter that's on her way. I've been coaching girls soccer in one way, form another over the last 18 years. And I had the epiphany because I've coached a lot of people in real estate and I've coached a lot of girls in soccer and girls who have played college soccer. And I found myself telling my clients the same thing. Huh. Although I was applying a lot of what I learned in business to soccer, I, it allowed me to break it down to people in a way that they understood. What, an example is I would say to a girl, hey, you can't run after the ball is played. You've got to be there before the ball gets there. If you're going to win, if you're going to get to the ball, you got to be there before it gets there. You have to anticipate. Well, in real estate, you got to be there before the ball gets there. If you want to be really successful in real estate, you have to find off-market deals before the real estate agent, not the other investor, before the real estate agent. If you beat the real estate agent, you'll beat everybody else. You got to know how to do that. And you got to be there before the ball gets there. So the tagline came from things like that. Don't mistake good for great. I know your parents said it was a good shot, but you should have passed the ball there. It would have been a great play. So you get that a lot in soccer. The parents yell, great shot. Good. And you're like, no, 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 it wasn't a good shot. She took it from an impossible angle and hit the side of the goal. She should have <laughs> slotted the ball. So I spent a lot of time correcting the girls from the parents' lack of soccer IQ on the sideline. So they don't mistake good for great when there's an opportunity to do something great. Really interesting. I can see how there's a lot of uh, lessons that are similar in both business and sports, like coaching girls soccer. So yeah, really cool there. An interesting tagline, one of those things I had to open up with and just kind of understand what yeah. you meant by that. So yeah, now that's, I get it. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> awesome. Well, going back to your story, Greg, so you mentioned you did these first three flips with a partner, made phenomenal profits on them. The first three, it sounds, what was next for you there? What'd you start doing after that? 
So we started doing more deals. We started learning the hard way. I mean, there's only one way to really, like I coach people. I can prepare them for everything, but until you do a deal, you don't know. You think you know, you have a theory, but until you actually do the deal, then you really know and your confidence can soar, especially when you start to understand how it works and that it's real. I had a client recently, it was so funny. He made 18,000 on a deal. Thought he was going to make more. And I'm like, man, he's going to be so disappointed. He's like, Greg, I just changed my life. I only make 38,000 a year. I do this two more times this year. I don't ever have to work again. I just do this. And he kept his job. He bought a trailer. He wrapped it. I buy houses. And he went all in. And I'm like, okay, I have to remember even myself that you get that first deal. It changes your world because you now have belief. You see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know you can get better. You know you can make more money. And so, you know, from there, the other thing that happened is I'd only done a few deals and somebody approached me and said, show me how to do what you did. And I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I've only done a few deals. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it was an accident. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, you've done more than me. I'm like, no. And they're like, I'll pay you. I'm like, pay me, pay me for what? I'm still learning. And then they kept insisting. And finally I said, okay, tell you what, I'll show you exactly what I did. And if you make at least $20,000, you can pay me five. And they made 80,000 and they paid me five. And then they said, let's do it again. Except this time they brought two people with them who wanted to learn. And then the light went on for me that when you become an expert in something, you get to have multiple streams of income. You don't just do real estate. I got to do real estate. I got to coach real estate. I got to loan out money. I started creating multiple businesses and multiple streams of income with my expertise. And then it developed into a large business that by 2006, I was making 200,000 a month, just doing real estate and helping people out. And I was at that point working about an hour a day. Wow. Well, that's quite yeah. significant. And I'm not bragging because we could talk about 2007 when we get to that <laughs> point. <laughs> so for 10 years, life was literally the dream. Real estate gave me so much. God giveth and taketh away. So does real estate. That's what I tell people. Well, before we get to the 2007 turn, we kind of probably have an idea of what happened there. But so it sounds like Pre-2007, you were spending most of your time doing your own real estate investments. Sounds like it was predominantly fix and flips and then teaching others how to do what you're doing. Sounds like you're experiencing a phenomenal amounts of success. So tell us exactly what you were doing, what markets you were focusing on, what was working for you, and uh, just kind of walk us through that time frame. Yeah. So in 2004, that was my big breakthrough year. I was doing well, but in 2004, I flipped 104 houses here in Salt Lake City. They were all three to $600,000 houses. I had an ad in the newspaper that said, I buy houses. I probably got half of them from that ad. The ad ran me $600 a month. And then I probably did about another 1500 a month in ads. And the way I flipped the houses, I seller finance or lease option to all of them. And so what we would do back then, you can't do this anymore. Or if we ever they ever allow this again, if you work with anybody else to learn how to do real estate, you're crazy. Because I was this, this I was perfect. This was at. your niche. This was my niche. And so what we would do is we'd buy the house and then we would refinance it 30 days later and pull 100 to 150,000 out. Then we would lease option the property. I ended up, I owned a mortgage company. I owned a construction company. I started getting paid five different ways on everything I was doing. And what we did is I would put the money in the bank. And then in 12 months, we would help people with their credit because usually that's why they were lease optioning because my ads all said lease option available, bad credit, okay. And the mostly, I worked with um, people don't like the ears. There's a lot of dentists and doctors who'd got nailed in the stock market and a lot of car salesmen because their income can go up and down. And so when they're rolling, they're rolling and they want a nice house. And when they're not, they're not. And so from that, in 12 months, once we had their credit fixed, we'd refinance the house into their name. And then whatever money was left in the bank account, that was the profit. We did that 104 times and our average profit was about 80,000 a house. It was a crazy year. So from there, 2005, I started doing the same thing and a weird thing happened. There was a time in real estate where the banks would lower the house $100,000 30 days after they listed it. And then I would go in and offer 80,000 less and get it. And I maybe had five competitors. These are foreclosures. Foreclosures, bank owned. It doesn't work this way anymore. And there was nobody knew how to get the loans done. And we had we had figured out how to get them done. And then what happened in 05, one day I made an offer on a property and an agent that I bought multiple properties from is like, hey, Greg, I always take your offers because I know you can close, but I, I can't take it this time. I would even get my offers accepted if someone offered more because of my track record of, record of closing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm a little confused. I'm like, well, do you know what the offer is? She goes, you know, 
know I can't tell you, but they offered 15000 over list price. And I'm like, why would they do that? Why would somebody do that? Somebody's the messing bank, up your system. The bank will take like 80 less. Why would you do that? And I'm like, that's stupid. I'm like, whatever. It's a fluke. Somebody really wants a house. Next house, same thing happened. Next house, same thing. And there was a turn in the marketplace. And what it was is George Bush at the end of 2004 took the lending limits off of real estate. And there was companies out there like Nouveau Riche had popped up. And they started teaching people to buy houses at whatever you're getting them because values are going up so fast. You'll still make money and you'll beat out all these seasoned investors, which they were right. And it worked. So I moved into building homes because there was no competition there. And so halfway through 2005, I started building about 130 homes. I just started buying land, building homes. And then the people who I taught how to do real estate, they started paying me to teach them how to do what I was doing, building homes. So they'd pay me $10,000 and I'd teach them how to get the land, get the builder, build it, list it, sell it, make money. Worked great until about halfway through 2007. Yes. So one thing I want to pull out here is I look at real estate investing kind of like having this tool belt and you've got different tools for different markets, property types, whatever it is. For a while, you're really making things happen with this seller financing model. That dries up. That's no longer working in your market. So then you start developing new single family homes. So you're just going to going through your tool bag, picking and choosing what's right for that market, for that environment, based on all these external factors, regulations, lending requirements, supply and demand, just all these things. So I think it's important to note that you were able to quickly identify that pivot, find a new area that's working for you, find something else out. So yeah, really important takeaway there. So then 2007 happens. I'm assuming most people listening realize that in about that time frame, the housing industry really crashed. So walk us through, you know, what happened with you. So two things. Number one, I don't teach people ABC one, two, three, because every market's different. Every climate's different. Economies are different. Year to year's different. There's a lot of people out there teaching a system that works and it works, but it won't work in a year or in two. And if you don't know how to do real estate for real, you won't be able to adjust. Like if you're an amazing marketer and you can find wholesale properties and flip them to other investors and you become amazing at marketing, but you don't learn real estate, when that dries up, you won't be a real estate investor. You'll be looking for something else to market. So that's the thing where I distinguish myself from a lot of people is you got to have all the tools. You got to know how banks work. You got to know how money works, financing works, real estate. Now, as far as 2007, the crux of it is my business partners and I had done so well that we had a $100 million line of credit for building homes and we could approve our own loans because we had a mortgage company. It was definitely the fox watching the hen house, right? We were doing <laughs> things the right way. But when the bank and regulations change, what happened to us is the federal government government disallowed these kinds of lines of credit anymore. Mm -hmm. And not only did they disallow them, all the banks had to call the notes due. So we're building at the time, it was 87 houses were being built. And we were three quarters of the way through most of the houses. And we had 30 days to pay back the bank. And I had millions of dollars in the land, but all my money's in the land. And they're like, yeah, not our problem. I go, but I'm going to lose that money. And they're like, we know. I'm like, but you're going to lose millions if you do this. It's just, it's literally going to fall apart. I spent two years unwinding those projects. I was able to move 63 of the homes out of the 87, okay. but in the end, couldn't move them all. So lost the money, ended up, I lost my million dollar home. At the end of my BMW lease, I turned it in, my 750 Li, bye-bye. The Denali turned it in, bye-bye. I bought a 1997 Plymouth Voyager with 140,000 miles on it, moved into a 3,300 square foot rental. And my income literally went in four months from 200,000 a month to zero in four months. And then I spent two years trying to fix everything. When the music stopped, I was 500,000 in debt like right back to day one of my life. I might as well be a ski instructor back up at Deer Valley. Oh man! And then I decided, well, I probably should go get a job, save some money and get back in the real estate game. So I tried getting a job. Nobody would hire me. Like I hadn't worked in a decade. They're like, as soon as you figure out real estate, you're going to quit on that. And I'm very straightforward with people. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like I'm getting the job so I can get back in the game, right? So one of the largest real estate education companies in the country offered, and a friend of mine owned it, said, Greg, I'll pay you 42000 a year to come coach people in real estate. I'll take it. 42 is 42 a year. So I drove the Plymouth Voyager for a year, cut the cable off, cut everything, cell phones, got rid of them, cut food budget down. I saved 
dollars. And then I took that twelve thousand dollars, gathered three other investors, and bought fifty-seven properties in Columbus, Ohio. Twelve months later, and I quit. And wow. uh, yeah. I was back in real estate again. And I paid four thousand a house, low-income houses in Columbus, Ohio. That first year, my partner and I made about four hundred thousand dollars. That was after seven hundred thousand in fire, theft, and vandalism losses on these low-income houses. So we tightened up that part of the business so we'd make more money the next year. And then somebody led us to Dayton, Ohio, and introduced us to, we started buying 100,000 square foot buildings for $200,000. And we bought up two full city blocks. And we started an adaptive reuse project. That's it. So I went from doing high-end homes in Salt Lake to building high-end homes to doing low-income real estate to downtown adaptive reuse projects using HUD funds and learning about how to abate taxes and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And I've exited that project and now I'm in a totally different type of real estate. I bought my first dispensary in Southern California. We're closing actually today. And I'm doing that. That's my next business. And I'll be manufacturing pure CBD oil here in about six weeks. Wow. So interesting. So you have to ask. That's a lot to take in. (laughs) (laughs) It's uh, quite the peaks and valleys story. And I have to ask you, like, what was your mindset in some of these low points in times? How did you keep going? How did you not think like, all right, this real estate thing, it was good while it lasted, but I got to do something else. Like just kind of walk us through having that mentality. It's mindset. It's partly the way I'm wired. I mean, I do all kinds of jokes about the Plymouth Voyager because I came from this $100,000 car that I'd be like, how do I turn on the windshield wipers? Because the BMW does it automatically. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I got to roll down the windows. Like, are you kidding me? But the thing is, is I grew up in a 900 square foot home in a basement where the heater was above my brother and I going into the house in New England winters. And so for me, I'm just not scared of the bottom and it doesn't bother me. It stinks. It's tough being at the bottom, but I'm not afraid of it. And I know if I can get from there to where I got, I have all this knowledge in my head now. And no matter if you lose the money, no matter what people take away from you, you still have the knowledge. And so what I recommend to people is you grow strong roots and really know what you're doing and know the game. And you really understand how to do real estate. And man, I've read over a thousand books on positive thinking, leadership, and real estate. Now, the last thing they made it, when I was on the mat in 2010, nine and 10, and I was- On the mat, huh? Mike Tyson- knocked me clean out. I was probably outside the ring out. I wasn't on the mat. I was probably on the concrete floor. Here's the thing. I got four daughters and a son and I had raised them. You can do anything you want in life if you work hard enough and you get after it. And I knew if I stayed on the mat, I'd be doing the exact opposite of what I taught them. So I get off the mat because I wanted them to see the comeback of the year, comeback of the century, however it was. And that's the thing that drives me that no matter what happens, I'm going to keep coming back because they got a lot of years to live and they got to know how to come back too. So this is the mindset someone really has to have if they want to succeed in real estate for the long term, because as a real estate investor, you're going to have these peaks and valleys and these punches to the chin, and you're going to take some losses. So you really have to be prepared for those and kind of mentally prepare yourself now for what's to come in the future. Yeah, 100%. And that is 100% true. The other thing about all this is I now teach people how not to get where I got. See, I could have avoided the valleys, like not completely, but I made enough money. So I believe you have to focus to make create wealth and create money. If you're creating 200,000 a month, and you don't become wealthy, you're a fool. And I was a fool. I was in my 20s, early 30s. I was bulletproof. Every deal I ever touched work. I didn't lose any money before 2007 on any deals. And so I was 10 foot tall and bulletproof and nobody could tell me different. Touch of arrogance. I had an entourage. I I mean, life was crazy. When I lost everything, I found out who my real friends were. You know, the 25 people that hung out in my business was now four dudes who I'm like, wow, these guys are loyal because I got nothing for them. And what you learn in life is once you create that money, you need to get it into other investments so that you're protected, that you're diversified. If something goes wrong, that you protect yourself and don't go all the way to the bottom with the ship. I thought it was noble to go all the way to the bottom with the ship. The problem was, had I just set aside 500,000, I could have started over, got back in the game in 2009, been right back where I was by 2010, and probably could have made enough money to make amends with any problems left behind. 
something, yeah. you know, if that makes sense. And I, you know, over the years, I created payment plans with the money I owed. I just stick to the plan and most of that money's paid back. I still got a little ways to go. I could pay it all off, but they're lucky to even get their money back based on what happened back then. So for me, now I teach people how to avoid those lows. Your first two years should be a roller coaster ride. But once you start making money, if you have a low, it's because you went all in or you were too aggressive or you were too leveraged. And you don't need to do that to win big. I don't regret going for it. And if somebody told me today, for the next 10 years, Greg, you're going to have the same lifestyle you had from 97 to 2007, but you're going to lose it all at the end, I'd do it. Because I did more in the 10 years than most people ever do in their lifetime. When do people get to ski 50 days a year as an adult and go on vacation one week a month and drive $100,000 cars and be able to give to all the charities they want to give to and live in a million dollar home and have a swim pool and tennis courts and have season tickets to the jazz, even though you're a Celtics fan. I always have to throw <laughs> that in there and have season tickets on the front row to Real Salt Lake and be able to take friends to the game. Nobody lives like that. Mm -hmm. I'll do that again for 10 years, even if I know I'm going to lose it because I'm not afraid of the bottom and I know how good the top is. But this time, hopefully you're not going to hit the bottom from those lessons no, learned. No way. No way. <laughs> this time, no way. Well, it's been a while since I've asked this question on the podcast, but I used to ask everybody their best and worst deals. So maybe give us one of your worst or craziest deals. It sounds like you've probably got some pretty good war stories. So walk us through something that... I mean, I don't even know where to start with worst deals. There's, at least, there's quite a few. Best deal, though, I had an ad in the paper back in the day. I got a call from a kid and he said, look, my parents are getting divorced and my uncle loaned them the money on the house and he's in Texas and they're fighting over the house, but it's really his money. We just need to get it sold. And my uncle's in charge of it. So we just want to get it sold quick. My dad's agreed. My mom doesn't know, but it is what it is. She's not on title. I said, well, I don't know what the family dynamic is, but I'll look at the house. So I went over and they, so the guy had a loan on it for 750,000. They sold it to me for 500,000, give or take, maybe it was 490 right in there. And here was the caveat. There was a lot attached to it. And I'm like, is the lot subdivided? They're like, yes. And I'm like, interesting. And it was in a very well-to-do neighborhood. And I go, well, if I buy it, I'm probably going to sell the lot. And they go, yeah, you're going to tick off the neighbors because see that huge playground? I'm like, yeah, we put in the playground, that neighbor put in the pool, and that neighbor put in the tennis court, and we share them. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, how do you guys, and they're like, hey, we don't care, we're moving. I'm like, okay. So I told them, I want you to sell me the lot for a dollar and the house for, I think it was four nine. That way I can sell the lot without fighting with the lender. So I bought the house for four ninety. I seller financed it for $680,000, ultimately sold it for $680,000. So I made butter, all right? so. bread and butter. And then I sold the lot a week later to a builder for 130. So at the end of the day on that house, I made like $220,000 and I had 130 thousand in my pocket in a week. And that was like, that was a sweet deal. I mean, the worst house, I've got names for the worst house. I mean, we, you know, there's the boob job house, there's the panda bear house, there's, <laughs> I mean, I got names. I have a whole thing and I, I hope you don't mind if I swear, but I have a whole book that I want to write that it's called That Shit Happened Real Estate. I got a whole book of <laughs> stuff I've seen, done, been a part of over the years. Well, when you write that book, we'll have you back on the show to promote it for sure. <laughs> yeah. So far, I have 82 different stories, deals from real estate that are just unreal. Uh, I mean, the panda bear house was just crazy because it was a Japanese modern style panda bear house that we purchased from the bank knowing nothing about it. And then found out later that the mom died in the house and contractors kept leaving the job because it was haunted, quote unquote. It, and then realtors started asking if it was, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And by the end, we couldn't get anybody to move into it. So we finally sold it for no profit and just got rid of it. Some guy bought it and then he's been there ever since. I don't know if he's had the same problems as everybody else, but that was a bad deal. And so, and I, you know, to this day, I'm like, I don't know. I never saw it or had any experiences while I was at the house, but everybody else did. <laughs> Well, Greg, in today's market, some people think that we might be at the top of the market, not necessarily that there's some kind of crash coming or anything like, you know, in the 2007, 2008 housing crisis. But let's say there were some factor that was going to create some crash in the housing market. What lessons would you give to somebody in today's environment to prevent the mistakes that you made back in that time frame? So back in the middle of 2006, I knew the crash was coming. I was in an investment bank. If you go watch the movie, The Big Short, I've watched it 
it. I didn't need to. I lived it. It was That's exactly how it went. But in the middle of 2006, we knew it was coming. We were actually trying to figure out how do we build the rest of our houses fast enough and get them sold before the crash actually happens. That was our goal. How do you avoid it? It's a tough one. Everybody thinks they can predict it. If people are being honest, most of the people who got out were getting out for other reasons and got a little lucky. Those that stayed in, a lot of us were trying to get out. And then the people who had no idea, didn't see it was coming. Typically, those people, they didn't really know anything about real estate. They were Arby's managers doing spec home building because somebody told them it was a good way to make money. And yeah. so for that reason, I think it's really hard to actually avoid. Now, our current market, it's not 2006. So here's the deal. We have more equity in America than we had in 2006, more income, more disposable income, less debt than we had in 2006. So all of those factors right there tell me we're not in the same position. Look, the stock market crashed in 03, 04. It crashed in 97, but real estate didn't. Typically, when the stock market crashes, the money goes into real estate. And that's what happened in 04. Real estate got a boost. And George Bush taking the lending limits off gave it a boost. Because what he did is he took Bill Clinton's every person own a home right. and he put it on steroids. And it was awesome. I hope we do it again. It's good for business on my end. So if the stock market were to drop this time, the money's going to go into real estate. The other thing that happened in 07 and 08, the stock market was crashing because of the real estate and banking industry. And that hadn't happened. It happened a little bit in the 80s with the savings and loan scandal. And it happened in the 30s. Other than that, the other stock market crashes was when the stock when the tech markets crashed and that doesn't really affect real estate the same way it actually helps real estate because money's got to go somewhere from the institutions and so looking out at the landscape what we really and the other thing that's going on is this is why the market's flattening out it's flattening out right now purely because the interest rates are going up but in millennials specifically they're ripping us off now, baby boomers remember under Carter when interest rates were 14%. So six and a half to them is fine. And in 2006, the rates were six and a half. A good loan was six to six and a half. And you were willing to do 7% interest to get a deal done. So right now, under a healthy economy and under a Republican president, in Republican control, you're going to see interest rates, I believe, go to six and a half percent. If a Democrat takes control or the Democrats do, you'll probably see it come back down to five and five and three quarter. The flattening is people getting ticked, but eventually mortgage brokers are going to start saying, because they got to close deals, if you don't lock at six and a half percent, it could go to seven. And then you're going to see the market start to go up again. And you're going to see people accept the new economy, just like they accept how long for how long was it 99 cents to get a burger at McDonald's? Now it's a dollar forty nine. So for two weeks everybody complains and then they're happy to pay a dollar forty nine. That's the flattening in the economy. And so the next step is is the stock market gonna go? I don't believe that Donald Trump and the Republicans will allow the markets to crash before the next election. I think they will do everything and anything in their power, subsidy wise, with oil with everything else to keep the markets intact. Now, after then, all bets are off. After then, all bets are off. Uh, it, are we due for a correction? Look, the market corrects every seven to 10 years. It's been 10 years since we've had a correction. But correction doesn't mean crash. The flattening could be the correction. Or one segment, if the stock market drops and it has nothing to do with real estate, I'm not really that worried about real estate. As a matter of fact, it'll give everybody an opportunity to get a house 20, 30,000 lower than a year will be back up to the value that they dropped to from. And another interesting thing to bring up in uh, along the lines of this topic is the Federal Reserve has indicated their activity in the 2019 coming year with a few impending rate increases. So you have to ask yourself, what's that going to do to the world of real estate? Obviously, it's going to increase interest interest rates, you're going to be able to buy little or house for the same amount of money. So you know, you kind of have to be looking towards the future and understanding what that means to you as a real estate investor. 
Absolutely. I always use California as an example, and the rest of the country doesn't like to hear this. Look at what they're paying for houses and just know that the economy, wherever you are, can eventually handle that if it comes to it. Californians pay 500000 for a 1,500 square foot home, and people in the rest of the country, how do they afford that? Now, they get paid a little more, but the market's going to keep going up, whether people like it or not. And the other part of that is this is the bigger factor than the interest rate. The bigger factor factor is millennials are getting married much older. They're having less kids. They have less of a need for a house and the type of houses that have been built. That to me could be a bigger problem for real estate investing in the future than the actual rates going up. Yeah, now we're looking at even bigger indicating factors such as demographics of a whole generation. And what you're saying is barely true. I fit in that demographic. Many mm -hmm. of my peers fit in that demographic. And it's very true. People are waiting till later in life to get married, have kids, buy a home, if they're even doing those things in the first place. Lots of people are delaying those and delaying those. And some people aren't even doing those things at all. So <laughs> yeah. So it's an interesting, and you have the baby boomers going, well, I don't need a house anymore. I'm, I'm downsizing. And so I looked at a house the other day, it was six bedrooms, three baths. And I'm like, they built this house back in the late seventies, early eighties. The average family in Utah had six to eight kids. This house was oh, yeah, built for Utah, that. Such a large family, huh? This house was built for that family. And now the average family in my age group has three to four kids. And in the next generation, it's going to be two or three kids. Yeah. So right away, we're like, all right, let's just take these two bedrooms and make it into the most incredible master suite we can make it into. I was trying to find ways to take bedrooms out of the house to make it more appealing to a modern family. And that's a different shift. It could affect our pricing in the future on large homes. Yeah, interesting. Well, Greg, if you just had to boil down all of your experience into one like actionable piece of advice for newer investors out there, what would you tell somebody looking to grow their portfolio, maybe buy their first investment property, maybe somebody in that type of career range? Well, the great Warren Miller of the great Warren Miller ski films always said, if you don't ski it this year, you'll be one year older next year. And so you got to start, you got to get educated, you got to start. And with my own son, we were talking about it yesterday. He's like, am I going to be in the family business? I'm like, you're going to have to earn it. He's like, well, when can I start? And I'm like, oh, believe me, a lot younger than you want to. Because <laughs> He's going to hit 15 and he's going to be in the family business working, right? And my daughter, who is now 21, did her first flip when she was 19. So my advice to people, start now. You're 18. You're an adult. I have a, a friends of mine whose son, who's 16, did his first deal. And he bought a rental property. He owns it. And yes, he's a landlord. And he didn't use any of his parents' money. That's they awesome. taught him how to go get his own deal done. Now, if he wasn't their kid, maybe he would have been told no. But at the end of the day, I start while you're in college. If you want to do real estate and you're ready to go, start now. I have a new client who's 60, retired New York City police officer. He's starting this week. And I have another client who's 23 and he owns nine deals already in the last year. He looks at the 23-year-old because I you like, know, oh, showed him. Because the 23-year-old has a tendency to complain. And I'm like, why don't you talk to Michael over here about what you have to complain about when you already have nine deals at 23? You're going to be a millionaire before you're 28. That's the reality. <laughs> so I tell people it's harder when you start young. It's hard to get credit. It's hard to get experience. Here's the deal. It's going to be hard no matter when you start because then you're, you might have kids. You might have a spouse. You might have a job that takes 60 hours a week or 50. I don't care what stage you start in life. It's not going to be easy. It only gets harder. So yeah. I tell people start young and then I tell them to get educated. There's so many ways to get educated in today's world on how to do real estate between YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and bigger pockets and coaches and courses that are out there. Heck, you could go find a Carlton Sheets course probably at a Goodwill store or thrift store and that for five bucks and you have everything you need to know to do real estate. Oh, that information's dated. 80% of that information still works today. Math is still math, right? So. Math is still math. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Well, Greg, it's been a real fun conversation and very entertaining to hear your journey, all these trials and tribulations, rags to riches, back to rags to riches again. So really fun and just interesting to you know see what you've done and how you've experienced real estate throughout your journey. Now, as we're wrapping up here, we wrap up every episode with a lightning round. We like to ask all of our guests, are you up for it? I'm up for it. 
Let's do it. All right, great. Well, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what did you do to overcome that? Belief, mindset, and believing I could do it, that a kid with a 2.0 GPA, not considered the brightest bulb in the bunch, can go out there and do real estate and make more money than my smarter friends, allegedly. Yeah. Yeah, now, sure. <laughs> the way I got it, though, was reading books. It started reading books like The Magic of Thinking Big, The Magic of Believing. Uh, there's a book called Being Happy by Andrew Matthews. I started there, positive thinking, changing my mindset, setting outcomes, having affirmations, getting to a point where I don't need affirmations because it's a way of being. If people don't tell you you're an optimist, you're doing it wrong. When people tell me I'm an optimist, I'm like, uh huh, that's the only way to get ahead in life is to believe it could happen for you. So I think you have to start there before you even educate yourself in real estate. You have to get an inner voice that believes in you and is positive and optimistic that'll push you to do it. Because if you're like me, most of us, whether it's teachers, coaches, or parents, have a negative inner voice or one that we gave ourselves. If you had a parent that told you you could do anything and you could do real estate and you become president of the United States, you probably have a very positive inner voice. But what I know about reality is 95% of people have a negative default system. Hmm. Yeah, maybe that's something I've taken for granted up to this point. But yeah, you're probably right there. Get a positive default system. And the best way to do it, when you read a book, whether it's whether you listen to it or read it, you're in your thoughts and the words become your voice and eventually it becomes your own words. And, and you can't stop. I've stopped at points in my life reading. And the only thing I've learned is you can't stop because that negative voice will come back. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't have a negative voice. God bless you. Life <laughs> is really good for you. You're happy all the time. Life's good. And I know people like that. But for most of us, we're fighting an inner battle and trying to overcome that. Yeah. Well, Greg, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Maybe you kind of alluded to it in this previous answer, but reading, reading, yeah. reading, reading, reading. I have people that do a lineable and listen to books. I like to read. There's a lot of things I do though. I also I have this belief I get up every day with faith and expectations that I'm gonna get what I need today and it's gonna work. Faith and expectations. Yeah, Greg, how do you do it? And, uh, faith and expectations. They go, yeah, but how do you do it? And I'm like, man, let me say it again. Faith and expectations. If you don't believe it's going to work or you don't believe in yourself or you don't have faith in yourself or you don't expect to have success today, boy, you're down by 20 points and Michael Jordan's on the other team. <laughs> That's not a good place to be. <laughs> not a good place to be. Well, Greg, do you have an online resource that you find valuable in your day to day? <laughs> Google. My daughter, who's now in college, but when she was in high school, she would bring homework stuff to me. Hey, dad, do you know this of the Constitution? Da, da, da. And I'm like, uh, did you ask Google yet? She's like, well, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I would I'd probably just Google it. And she'd Google it. And she'd go, oh, yeah, there's the answer. And so I teach people, like, before you go asking a bunch of questions, Google it, read it, get educated, then go ask a really intelligent question. That'll le the Google will lead you to lots of great resources. It could lead you to me. It could lead you to bigger pockets. It could lead you to Grant Cardone. It could lead you to Carlton Sheets material. It could lead you to Robert Kiyosaki, but the information's all out there. When yeah. I coach people, I can teach you how to do real estate in three days. It's going to take me a whole year to fix your head. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's going to take me a whole year to overcome whatever's going on in here. The know-how, that's all over the internet. It's actually fairly easy. Yeah, exactly. Well, you've mentioned a few books already, but what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? My favorite one is Being Happy by Andrew Matthews. And the reason I love it, he's an illustrator and a cartoonist. What he figured out is our mind works in pictures. So somebody says a word, you see a picture. And what ends up happening is, and I'll use my daughter as a goalkeeper in soccer, people would say to her, hey, Brooke, don't let any goals in today. And I'd be like, whoa, 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 don't say that to my daughter. And I was dead serious. People were like, I said, tell her to save every shot because we don't have a picture for don't or no. So when you say don't let any goals in, you see the ball going in the goal. When you say save every shot, you see the goalie making a save or the hand hitting the ball. I want my daughter focused on the right thing and being happy. Wayne Gretzky, when you see the goalie, I don't see the goalie. I only see the net. That's the difference between, and it doesn't matter what level. See, Wayne Gretzky is the greatest because he was faster than everybody else. There's some slow kid in D1 or D2 hockey leading the league that won't ever play in the NHL because he's slow, but he thinks like Gretzky. And in spite of being slow, he's still leading the league in goals scored. So 
so no matter what level you're at, it works. And then the last part of that, that he, the other example he uses, the mom says to the kid, don't fall out of the tree. And then the kid falls out of the tree and they go, I told you not to fall out of the tree versus what you should say to the kid, be careful in the tree. Because now the kid pictures being careful and grabs on tighter. That's my favorite book. It's the epiphany I had from that book was so profound. Unheard of book. Very few people have read it. It's a book I can recommend that people are like, look, I could, I have the servant is in James C. Hunter. That's one of my top books. There's a difference between influence and power. If you have power, you can wield it. And people will do what they say as long as you have power. And then one day you won't. See, when I lost everything, nobody had to listen to me. So the question became, do I have any influence? And how do you get influence? And even when you have power, how do you use influence instead of the power? So as a parent, as a leader, as owner of a company, as a coach, I try to influence people rather than use power to get them to do what I want. And so that book, profound. But those two books, they're they're my top two. I love it. Awesome. We'll link those books in the show notes. Our audience members want to pick those up. Being happy is one of those ones that I've never heard of. So I'm excited to uh, add that to my reading list and get after it. So Greg, very last question in our lightning round before we wrap up for the day. If you were to give advice to your 20 year old self to get started investing in the world of real estate, what would that be? Go get your first property. Just do it. Don't wait. No excuses. No fear. I mean, you just got to get it done. You get that first property then. I mean, I was lucky. I would have only been ahead of myself by six years. But again, do it. You find a mentor. My dad was actually a good mentor in my life for life. And then I had a mentor that people always laugh at this. He was in the Amway business. He was a diamond. And he was the guy who taught me to read in college. And then my next mentor, Harold Higginson, who nobody's ever heard about other than he's the guy with the Mercedes and the thousand yeah, dollars suit. Okay. He taught me more about business and life and money and belief than anybody else. And if you have someone like that in your corner, it can change your world. I had another mentor, W. Rolf Kerr, who he's quoted in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he always said, Greg, be yourself. And I'm like, okay, that's good. But be your better. <laughs> <You're> sure. <laughs> well, and then he had a caveat, but be your better self. Uh, there so, you go. It was okay to be yourself, but that's not a cop out. Be your better self. Your better self can get up a little earlier, stay up a little later, believe a little more, do a little more, work a little harder, be a little smarter, get a little more educated. That's all in your power. That's all in your control. Or you can play another video game, watch another TV show, watch another football game, hang out on Saturday and complain about where your life is. And so I've always had those people, those mentors, and they all, W. Rothger was my mentor from 20 to 22. Harold was my mentor from about 22 to 24. And then the other guy was my mentor from 18 to 20. That's where I went from getting 2.0 GPA in my first semester of college to I had a 3.7 GPA because of that mentor my fourth semester. And so at 20 years old, and man, people making money in business love helping a young gun who wants it. They love it. So why aren't you talking to people who got it, who can teach you and show you the way? And the best part about it, they won't give you any money to start, but they'll teach you how to find it. And that's more powerful. Yeah, definitely. So, well, Greg, hey, it's been an awesome conversation. Very entertaining. Lots of good takeaways and lessons learned from just understanding your journey and seeing where you've been and how you've done things. Now, as somebody with as much experience and as somebody with as much experience as you, you've got a lot of lessons to share with people, which you are doing through your breakawaymindset.com mentorship program there. So tell us a little bit about that and then tell us where people can learn more about you, connect with you if they got any other questions. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, add me on Facebook, Greg McCluskey, M-C-C-L-U-S-K-E-Y. I'm easy to find. I'm not a Century 21 agent, so that eliminates the other Greg McCluskey. <laughs> <laughs> But find me on Facebook. I put tons of free content, tons of stuff on Facebook. And then Breakaway Mastermind. I have a mastermind group for people who are ready to do real estate, not talk about it. We have a tagline. We do real estate. We don't play it. And I tell everybody, you get in my program. You're going to own some properties. You're going to own some properties fast. And you're going to have some stress in your life because we're not just sitting around talking about it like 80% of the real estate investors out there. Um, I've been doing this a long time. I meet people who are looking at real estate all the time, but they're not doing anything. 
things. So the mastermind group is for people who are sick and tired of talking about it and are ready to make it happen. And I only allow people in who are ready to go right now. And if you're not ready, I help you get ready, but it's probably going to take three to six months to get you ready. And so I do that for free. But if you're ready, we put you in a mastermind group with four other people and we go do as much real estate as we can do. So my yeah. first group started a little over a year ago and they've done over 40 deals. That's where it's at for my mastermind group. And then if you link up with me, get on Facebook, shoot me a message. I can send you a link to a webinar. If you're seasoned or you know a lot about real estate or you don't feel like you need coaching, I believe everybody's got to stay sharp. I have a coach that I work with I'm out of California on my businesses and keep me sharp. But if it's not for you right now, I have a webinar on three off-market strategies you can use in today's market to make money and beat the real estate agent and beat the other investor to get those deals. Awesome. Love it. Well, Greg, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Best place to connect with you, look you up on Facebook and from there, just all kinds of free resources and content you're putting out. So really appreciate you coming on the show today. Like I've said several times, it's been extremely entertaining. Really enjoyed having you on. So look forward to having you on back in the future. Thanks so much. You bet. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Take care. Take care. That wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Greg McCluskey. Wow, how exciting is Greg's story from rags to riches, back to rags, and then riches again. You can see that Greg has experienced tremendous success and tremendous failures. Persevering through all of those to come out where he is today just shows a lot about the power of mindset and positive thinking as Greg touches on at the end of the episode. So if you'd like to learn more about what Greg is doing, connect with him. Feel free to visit the links in the show notes where you can find his profile information on both LinkedIn, Facebook, and of course his website, breakawaymindset.com. Hey, if you liked the episode today, please go over, hit subscribe, leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. And Feel free to reach out, connect with me. You can do so at www.jacobayers.com forward slash contact. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.